I'm a community builder, which means that I love building the foundations of the communities that I'm a part of. And a big part, one that I'm a part of, is of course the Siddha Veda community, as well as Ratisha, my sister. Okay, awesome. I think I was having a little bit of trouble unmuting there. So if just if I could be made a co-host, that'd be awesome. Okay, all right. So my name is Ratisha Yuvaraju. I'm an incoming freshman at UC Berkeley. I'm also the founder of Mediora, which is an organization focusing on creating and promoting mental well-being and creating mental health resources within the community, as well as filling the minority gap in education in a variety of different ways. I also received designation from Berkeley as top 1% of their applicant pool out of about 90,000 applicants. So that was really exciting. I'm also a neuroscience researcher, specifically interested in researching ways to alleviate stress and anxiety. I coach and mentor students in a variety of different fields. One of them is speech and debate. So helping students be the most confident version of themselves while public speaking or helping students put their best foot forward while applying to colleges, which is what um, we're working on today. I've also been involved with Siddha Veda for the past five years. So I teach yoga classes with them. I'm helping out with the summer class. So it's been really exciting to work on this project in collaboration with Siddha Veda. Perfect. So some of the schools that we've helped people get into um, are ones that are very, very familiar, no matter what community you're a part of. Um, Harvard, Stanford, Cornell. We had a couple of students, um, we had a couple of students actually amass almost all of the Ivy Leagues this year. So get into like five and or six of them that we've helped. And so that was a really big success for us. Uh, UPenn, Vanderbilt, USC, UCLA, a multitude of the UCs, including UC Berkeley, UC San Diego, UC Davis, UC Merced, UC Santa Cruz, um, as well as more California schools, Claremont McKenna, which is a liberal arts college, Yale University, Purdue, Cal Poly, Emory, and many, many more. So these are some schools that we've helped people get into um, because we've been able to utilize our background, as Ratisha talked about earlier, in speech and debate and the specific activities that we did, but also highlighting them in such a way that how does what we do, although other people may do it, set us apart. And what makes us really different is that we have a transdisciplinary focus, which means that we're very interested in a multitude of different subjects and how we're using them to our benefit. So these are the schools that we've helped people get into, and these are the schools that we can help you get into as well. So for today's agenda, we're gonna be discussing different types of colleges and their features, pros and their cons. And this is just gonna be an intro into what these colleges are like, their separate features and how they can benefit you. And if you actually take a picture and scan the QR code that you're being seen on the screen right now, you can then sign up for our CAP series, which is our college admissions prep series. And what we're going to be doing is taking a deep dive into specifically what colleges are looking for and how we can help you better tailor your applications into being very unique and into standing out from the pack, especially with COVID-19 right now. How are you going to do that with possibly one more year or two more years or a couple more years of online education? So we're going to be coaching everyone through these separate steps into how you can be your best self. And another thing we're also going to be doing is if you want more information and more one-on-ones in that flyer as well, there's a link beneath um, all that information that has our separate Calendly links so you can set schedule and set up a meeting one-on-one um, -on -one so we can give you feedback as well. But we heavily um, suggest the college admissions prep series because it's gonna be a two-day in-depth seminar where we go through different aspects of transdisciplinary education, college prep, college essay writing, and really how to highlight your best self. And if there are any questions feel free to type them in the chat box or raise your hand. Awesome, so I just wanna quickly um, add to that a bit. Um, we're actually moving the date of the 
um, CAP workshop to account for some requests regarding the summer camp um, ending this week. So we'll have it next weekend. So just um, something to look out for. The links for that um, Sylvia had mentioned about for the registration or signing up for the one-on-ones, I've included in the chat box right now, if anyone is interested. So now we're gonna be talking about, like Tavia said, the importance of understanding what each different kind of college is has strengths and weaknesses in, but we're also gonna tie that into what is a transdisciplinary education and what kind of college might be best for you to apply to to pursue a transdisciplinary education. So it's not necessarily about getting into the top college, but it's more about getting into the college that fits best for you. So what a transdisciplinary education is, is it's learning or exploring a relevant concept in the world and integrating different forms of different disciplines and fields in order to connect your new and past knowledge to further real life experiences. So essentially it's a real life application of this would be something that Sudaveda is working on, which is dealing a lot with ancient medicine is one of the topics. So looking at how can we look at this coronavirus pandemic, take our knowledge in maybe ancient medicine, our knowledge in yoga and our knowledge in cooking, tie those together and apply them to the pandemic and do research in that field itself. So transdisciplinary education is a really wide um, umbrella of different fields that are being covered in order to pursue knowledge in one um, or further knowledge in one area of learning. So now we're going to be talking about what each different type of university is so that way we can see what are the best kinds of universities that might fit someone who is inclined to pursue a transdisciplinary education. So private universities are mainly funded by donors, alumni, and others such as maybe an endowment. They also have smaller class sizes, better student to teacher ratios. The student bodies are typically more geographic di geographically diverse. The reason for this is because sometimes public schools, let's take the UCs for example, have a certain quota of students that they need to take from California versus the rest of the schools. So private schools don't have these quotas that they have to adhere to. Therefore, you'll get a more geographically diverse student body. So if it's really important for you to be meeting people from all different kinds of backgrounds, you'll definitely get that at a public school and you'll definitely get it at a private school as well, just a little bit stronger. At a private school, there's also more opportunities for collaboration with faculty. This is largely in part because it's funded heavily by donors and alumni. The cost of tuition is higher, which is our last bullet point. So that gets you more time to work with the faculty. And you're more likely to graduate on time because you have those smaller class sizes and um, more advising to guide you throughout the process. Um, if you know any examples of private universities, feel free to type them in the chat or raise your hand and we'll see if you're right. Like it'll, it'll be sort of a game if you know any of them. Okay, we can um, go ahead and move on to the next slide. Oh, Perfect. someone said Vanderbilt. Oh. Yeah. Awesome. That's yeah. a great example. So now we're going to be talking about public universities. Now public universities are universities that are government funded. And so they can be funded by the state government. And examples of this would be the UC system, the University of California system. So a um, couple of examples of those are UC Berkeley, UC Davis, and a couple of the other ones that we stated earlier that we helped people get into like UCLA as well, UC Santa Barbara, UC San Diego. So those are all examples of public university under the UC system. There are also the Cal State universities, which are CSUs, and that would be more like Cal Poly, um, Sac State, CSUS, Chico State, but also in other um, states that are not California, like um, the Colorado State system, the University of Texas state system. Those are all examples of public universities as well. And those have bigger class sizes, meaning that you're going to be in those big lecture halls that you've probably seen 
in movies and TV shows where they have kind of like a hundred students, over hundreds of students sitting and taking notes. Luckily, those will be primarily in your intro years, so like your first two years of education, but that is definitely something that is more common in a public university are those big classroom sizes. Then um, because public universities are very state-based, you'll have local student bodies, meaning that students, um, maybe not a majority, but a large quantity of students will be from around the area, whether it's from directly around the city or around that state, you're going to be having a more local student body. This definitely has its perks. That means that you're going to be going to school with students who you probably knew or are probably from a couple towns away. And so you can go to school with your friends, but you also have the ability to make new friends as well. And those shared experiences is something that's very unique. Like if you're coming from a similar city, then you're going to be having very similar experiences with those people that, that you're meeting in these new areas. Also, you're going to be having more competitive sports team, which means that you're going to have a more spirited campus. Um, you're gonna be seeing a lot more activities, clubs, and things like that around the sports teams. And it's something that's very fun and enjoyable to have. And it also builds rapport, which means that the student community themselves are closer together. They're more willing to do things with one another. They're go more willing to go out into the community and do community service and things like that. And so you can see that there's a bigger level of community cohesion. Um, there's also a wider range of degree offerings. So what this means is that there's going to be a multitude of degrees available to you. In fact, many schools within these systems have hundreds of degrees that are available within their separate colleges. And that's really, really, really unique because not only does that mean that you can change your major if you're very uncertain, but that also means it gives you the opportunity to look at what you're really interested in. It means that you can mix and match majors and minors, and you can really pursue that transdisciplinary education that you're looking for. And that's really what we're looking at here, is how you can be unique and pursue that transdisciplinary education. A wide range of degree offerings means that you could have a major in English, but also be doing computer science at the same time, doing a research-based major, but also taking a look at maybe acting or something that follows your passion, um, looking at anthropology and societies and how they work, but also possibly doing business at the same time and understanding how those two mix. And so those are some of the offerings that we can see at public university. Of course, there are going to be a lot more. I was just naming a few. Next, there are also cutting edge facilities. Because they are government funded, you have more labs and faculty that are going to be reaching out to students to do more scientific research. And so that means that a lot of students on campus are going to be able to engage in scientific research opportunities. This is very, very important, especially for those of you who are pursuing transdisciplinary educations. This means that you can take a look into ancient medicine. It means you can take a look into neuroscience offerings. And Ratisha, if you actually want to touch more upon um, the scientific research opportunities that are available in public universities. Yeah, um, I'd be happy to. So regarding the scientific research opportunities available at public universities, there's a variety. So the really good thing about public universities is since they're government funded, in order to get that funding, they have to keep showing that they're using having a project and kind of following up with that. So they have to show that they're utilizing students, that they're um, actively making changes in different fields and actively pursuing different research. So the opportunities at a public university change from studying water and how we can improve um, if there's a drought to working with um, younger students who may be on the spectrum and testing different forms of maybe art therapy, for example. So the types of um, the types of research going on at a public university is very vast. There's a lot of different fields. Just because public universities tend to be bigger, there's so many people there with so many different interests, and um, there's very cutting edge research that is happening actively at public universities. I think another good point to mention that we'll definitely be going over in CAP is that um, public universities also are a little, while they may be cheaper, so you might get 
some like less opportunities. There are opportunities that public universities specifically offer during the summer that may be beneficial to you no matter your age. So if um, you guys are interested in doing some research or something, we can look at what your public universities are and help you guys find some of those opportunities by making, um, utilizing some of our connections for that um, sort of interest. So essentially pri both private and public universities have really cutting edge research happening on, going on. Another benefit, um, of public universities though, is since it's so big, the kinds of research happening are really widespread. But also, say if you're in the UC system or um, the public school system in Texas, the UTs, then those schools all have a connection with each other. So if you go to one of the public schools, you, you are able to connect to another university that's public in the, in your state itself. So essentially you're able to kind of hop universities for your research, which is a unique thing that lo not a lot of people know exists for public universities. Perfect, yeah, that's, those were some really great examples. And the reason I wanted Ratisha to talk about that as well is because Ratisha has been doing research for years ever since middle school on specific topics like these. And she's going to a university that she carefully selected that she knew would specifically highlight her interest in her specific field of research and utilize transdisciplinary education as well. And so what we're going to be doing during this CAP series is looking at your interests as well. And it will be so one-on-one um, -on -one because we'll be able to talk to all of you and have that time to be able to gauge your interest in different topics and help all of you out in taking a look at what school is going to be best for you in pursuing your interests as well. And as Ratisha also highlighted, we do have a lot of connections to these universities, to researchers at these universities, and programs that will help you get into these universities. So during that CAP series, we're really going to be diving into those too. So next, I'm going to be talking about liberal arts colleges. And liberal arts colleges, if you know any, feel free to put them in the chat and we'll see. Um, but liberal arts colleges are ones such as Claremont McKenna is a pretty big liberal arts college. The liberal arts college system um, in Mount Holyoke, such as Smith College, um, there's Pitzer College, Scripps College. There are a lot of liberal arts colleges, Sarah Lawrence College, Willamette in Oregon. And so these colleges offer a wide array of topics covered. And what that means is that they have an open curriculum while usually majoring in one discipline. So for example, some of the majors that are offered are like politics, philosophy, and economics. Like that's one of the majors offered at Claremont McKenna, it's known as PPE. And so you're seeing a lot of these majors that have different kind of topics within them, but they're in one specific discipline. And liberal arts colleges are really neat because they have small class sizes. In comparison to public universities that have around like 100 to 300 people for their general education classes, liberal arts colleges, as soon as you get there, your largest class size is probably going to be around 80 to 100. And that's the biggest it's ever going to get. And it's very rare that students at liberal arts colleges actually will go into a college this big, like a class that big. Their small class sizes really help foster discussion and dialogue which means that it helps students really understand their passion and contribute to the conversation. And so that means that faculty are more classroom and seminar experience based. This means that you're going to be doing reading and research and writing theories and understanding philosophy in order for them to really piece together what they're studying. It's more focused on that than it is research, but that doesn't mean that there's no research. Liberal arts colleges definitely do have lots of research going on that does take into account like the STEM feels like mathematics. And I think that a big common misconception is that there's no STEM in liberal arts colleges because the name itself says liberal arts, but that's not true. There's a lot of STEM factors that go into these schools as well. They just not, they're just not as highlighted as public universities and private universities. For example, when you think of like MIT, you're definitely thinking more STEM than you are like political science and English. And when you're thinking of liberal arts colleges, you're thinking of more um, political science and English and theory and PPE in comparison to STEM, but that doesn't mean that there isn't any. It just means that they're more focused on these things. And some universities actually have small liberal arts colleges within their school, 
which is really unique because then you can focus on your liberal arts education while still having that interest in that intersection as we talked about earlier in transdisciplinary education. So we talked about um, transdisciplinary educations a couple times, but Reticia is actually going to go into what it is further. Yeah, so we, um, we covered this in the beginning. So uh, just to touch a little bit more on this, say, for example, you're interested in yoga or you're interested in ancient medicine. Those are the two big examples we've been using today. So how do we apply this to the knowledge that we just learned about the different colleges? So say you're interested in yoga, but you're probably more interested in the research side of it. So you know that a liberal arts college is very focused on the community that they're building. They also, Akka, if you could go back to the liberal arts slide. Thank you. So the liberal arts college is here it covers a wide array of topics so you can research you can look into yoga but you might not be getting that research experience yet because faculty are more focused on classrooms so if you choose to want to go the yoga research route you might want to look into a college that is a liberal arts college inside of a bigger college so that's essentially when you're interested in pursuing a transdisciplinary education you want to look at what specific fields are you interested in and how will a college a type of college cater to it so that's essentially the first step in helping narrowing down your college list and um, i think that's really important to do no matter what your interests are um, also look at like what your budget is what kind of college works best for you and personally that's why um, for me, I chose Berkeley because I'm interested in a transdisciplinary education and they have a liberal arts college within their larger pub public college to get those sort of research experiences while getting that small um, liberal arts education. So that was important to me. So you have to essentially decide what kind of education is important to you. What kind of fields are you interested in studying more? The really important thing about a transdisciplinary education is that it's where your curriculum crosses. So some schools, when you start your major, they might be very tight as to what you can study, but some schools might allow more flexibility. If you like more flexibility, that's something to also note while making your college list and something that we can definitely help guide you to through if anyone has any questions. Perfect. So Reticia really touched upon why transdisciplinary educations are very important. And it's something that no matter what grade you're at, you should definitely be focused on. Like even if you're in middle school right now, you don't need to know what you're doing. Um, for college. You don't need to know your major quite yet. Don't worry. But what you do need to know is sort of what we talked about last week is talking about what extracurriculars you're going into and how you're going to highlight those on your college application. And transdisciplinary education is a big part of your extracurriculars because they're showing the intersection of your interests and really displaying those intersections of your interests are so key to standing out on your college application. And especially into the college that you're going to end up selecting, once they've accepted you, you're going to get lots of offers, especially if you attend our CAP series, which we can guarantee ha has happened to numerous of our clients. But that's something that's really important to us is making sure that you're highlighting your best self. And so we're going to be designing that for you. And like Reticia talked about earlier, definitely the transdisciplinary success portion of the meditation, the yoga, the research, and especially like a lot of our friends that we know during our time and the people that we've worked with were involved in Carnatic singing, Bardhanatyam, and a lot of these different things like playing the Veena. And so how can you highlight that in a way that is so interesting for a college admissions officer who might not know exactly what you're talking about, but really understand the cultural difference that that has in comparison to anyone else. It's an advantage that we have within our community. And so in order to help you prep yourself, um, we actually, uh, you can email us at, h at um, www, usually you can do just uh, gmail.com, and accelerate, so E-X-C-E-L-U-R-A-T-E -E -E at gmail.com, and Reticia's gonna send that link in the bio. 
and then we'll have the CAP series flyer up. And so right now we can do a Q&A session if there are any questions that anyone has. Feel free to just raise your hand if you have any questions. So I'm going to go ahead and um, share the screen as well, my screen with the flyer on it, if anyone is interested in attending the event. So. Okay. So right here, if you came to this webinar, um, just mention that when signing up in the bottom slot or we can see that you guys signed up today so that was probably sent from this webinar and we'll be giving you guys a ten dollar discount on the um, series we really want to make sure that um, our webinar is accessible to everyone and we're helping you guys put the best foot forward so if anyone has any questions about what um what we'll be discussing or just any general questions about the college admissions process um, that they'd like to ask now, we'd be happy to answer. So we have a question and it says, how do parents get convinced that transdisciplinary approach is more fulfilling to their kids? Um, I definitely think it's, it's a very, very um, important question because the transdisciplinary approach actually highlights a lot of skills that at the end of the day, the job force is looking for right now. But in terms of colleges, colleges don't wanna just see that you're very good at tennis. They don't want to just see that you're very good at robotics or coding or speech and debate. They want to see that not only are you very good at one thing, but you're also very good at another thing. And if you're very good at um, taking yoga, like Ratisha was talking about, and you're also really good at speech and debate, that not only shows that you have that um, ability to analyze cases and be argumentative, but it also shows that you're able to ground yourself if you're doing yoga to ground yourself and be mindful. And it shows two completely different um, sides of a spectrum. And that makes you really, really interesting to college admissions officers. And that's just one example, but there are multitudes of examples like that. Like if you're doing, for example, like Ratisha said, neuroscience research, but you're also playing soccer, that shows that you can also work individually in a lab, but you can also work with teammates. And like that, you could also switch out um, like Carnotic singing and soccer. It just, both of those things show very different nuances in what you're doing and how to display that. So that is a very, very good example for how parents could get convinced. I think a lot of kids are doing transdisciplinary things in their everyday lives. They just don't know it. And I think that um, a lot of parents are also supporting that lifestyle and they know it's important. I think that balance is very important as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, Debbie, I just wanted to add on to your your point, you know. Um, uh, we, I was doing my PhD in, um, uh, you know, I, I joined master's degree here in, uh, in Stevens Institute. I was very much interested in uh, yoga. That's the time I started an organization. I used to teach yoga that time, you know. And I wanted to really bring this uh, science integrated with uh, the thing, but there was no opportunity. I couldn't find any opportunity for bringing ancient science, but I could teach. I could teach uh, yoga independently in the department uh, through the, you know, graduate students association, et cetera, et cetera. So, right. So we, uh, but, um, you know, but as, as a mainstream science, I couldn't, so I was always thinking how I could do this, uh, how I could do this. So, and then what happened at the end of like, after I went to my PhD, uh, it was at the end of my PhD, I could find some connections between, you know, there was a ancient applications in uh, Siddha Ayurveda medicine. Uh, it is like, it's called Agni Karma. It is like a uh, using needles. Uh, we can cure our body, uh, you know, by punching different places. So it's called Agni Karma Nano. So I created a device called Agni Karma Nano Needle. So we, I have a provisional patent for that. So what I'm saying is, it's all possible. And when I went to a Harvard Medical School, that is where I was able to publish all the papers in uh, Ayurveda. I have more than 
45 papers now. So most of them it will be in Ayurveda or Siddha. So why I'm saying is, it's like, it took me a while to understand. That's the time I understood that even Bharatanatyam or any other uh, field, Carnatic music, everything can be integrated in modern science. Today, what we are doing, we are keeping things very separately. Somebody is singing something, they don't know what is the connection between that and brain and how we are going to integrate. They are learning these two things separately. And this is happening and therefore you are not going to use your full potential. So you are coming from a different tradition. That's also a traditional knowledge. It's very scientific. You have to use only scientific words. We don't know how to use the words. And if you know how to use the scientific words, we can integrate everything, including psychology to agriculture to many fields are there. So I just want to add on to that. So you go ahead, please. Thank you, Uncle. Yeah, the, that was a really, really good, important in life, in-person example. We also have the question that says, in the current educational curriculum, there's job and professional drive oriented. For example, even yoga discipline is looked at how much one can earn. Um, music, how can one earn a living? And so I think what, please correct me if I'm wrong, but what I'm um, getting from this question is that, how can one earn a living from pursuing music? Um, if not, please correct me, but that's what I'm getting. And there's a lot of different opportunities. In fact, lots of Ivy League schools like Cornell and Yale, um, other schools such as Tufts and Bard, all have masters in music um, uh, educational systems which means that you can go there to study music theory. You can go there to study this. And also you can do it interdisciplinary. So that means that not only are you learning at the Lincoln Center of Music, but you're also pursuing physics. And that's an opportunity as well. But in music, if you're taking a look at music composition, um, that is a way that you can earn a living. You can take a look at how songwriters compose, taking an understanding of different beats, understanding different beats from different cultures. Now that's more of an anth anthropological approach, taking a look at how Carnotic music differs from modern day music or how it developed. And so those are different ways. And research is also looking at music as well. How can music really calm one down, taking a look at different beats within the music, different frequencies, different tempos. And those are all different ways that researchers are looking for right now. So some ways you can earn a living is through research, composing, directing, playing your own instrument. Um, Juilliard is a great school if you want to continue on pursuing your music. And those are just a couple of ways. There are lots of different ways, like music theory, music composition are just a few. Hopefully that helped. Um, there's another question that, Ratisha, if you want to take this one, says, what challenges, if any, are you finding teen with teens to embrace ancient wisdoms? And Ratisha actually works with a lot of students within Mediora, her organization, with this exact um, question. So this is really good for her. Yeah, so the biggest thing that I've noticed when working with teens to embrace ancient wisdoms is that a lot of people don't actually know what ancient wisdoms are right so there's this kind of like concept this like stigma around oh it's like ancient we'll just use like modern science or it's like it's ancient I don't really want to go there it's not really real so the biggest issue that I've noticed with not e not even just teens um with just like mainstream media overall is that there's a misconception of what actually um transdisciplinary education is of what ancient knowledge is um and what a lot of the fields that we're, are now coming out um, like yoga, wellness, all of that to be is. And so the biggest challenge is that misconception around it. It's the fact that there isn't a lot of knowledge being directed towards students in, this, in the current um, Western education system that exactly says what ancient knowledge is. So what I've realized is that it's not about one form of knowledge being better than the other. It's about embracing both of them and to see how how can we learn from our western education system and how can we learn from the ancient knowledge systems combine those and really help people and i think that's where we can help start help people start to understand the value of both systems and once you do that it can really um, create a lot of different research a lot of different knowledge a lot of different contributions so the biggest challenge is helping people take that first step into understanding what it is but the biggest thing i've noticed is once people start to realize that what they're 
previously understood about ancient systems is wrong, then their curiosity comes in. They're interested to learn what is, what is this actually? And it's really about how we're teaching people about it because now yoga is becoming big. Now wellness is becoming big. So eventually our, it'll, it will help people. We will start to especially break those stigmas. So um, I do want to go on to the next question since I do see a few questions coming in. Um, Akka, would you like to take the next question since it's specifically directed towards Cornell? I think you're on mute. Thank you. This question says, what advice do you have to someone who's applying to Cornell as a first year student? Um, firstly, I would say definitely sign up for our CAP series because my advice differs per the student. That means like in order to give you proper advice for helping you apply, I would really need to know like what your interests are, what your background is, and definitely more information about you so that I can give, tell you exactly what to do and guide you along that process because not only did I go through that process, but I helped a couple of other people get through this process as well. But an overall um, big thing to give advice for is to not be afraid of being yourself and to truly write about the experiences that you had this past year um, or these past couple of years throughout your high school experience. This means that, um, definitely just diving into things that you don't expect. I think that the biggest thing is self-discovery and a lot of people are afraid to understand um, like about themselves, about their emotional being, about how they succeeded through like different obstacles and different struggles. And so I think my first one would to be to definitely to sign up so we could give you more in-depth information. But my biggest, my second biggest piece of advice would be to truly like do a little bit of research on yourself. This means like understanding why you're interested in what you're interested in, why you did like soccer for four years, why you played piano for four years. Because if you just um, did Carnatic singing for the past eight years, then you're not going to be able to convince a college admissions advisor why you did that or why you did yoga. So definitely understanding why you did those things is my second biggest piece of advice. Then the other question seems more like a comment and it's talking about, um, I think Ratisha definitely touched on this earlier about how it's challenging amongst teens and youth, but I think that if we expose them to these things through programs like Siddha Veda, then it becomes less intimidating. Um, I have completed the YCA, awesome. So did Ratisha and I <laughs> when we were younger. How can I yeah. do research if I'm unsure of my future major? So again, I would say definitely sign up for the CAP series because we're going to be talking about different opportunities in research and how Sita Veda can specifically give you those opportunities. Like there are a lot of community members within Sita Veda who can connect you to the opportunities, but how can you do research if you're unsure of your future major? You shouldn't be doing research that's based on your future major. You should be doing research that is based on your current interests. Mm -hmm. Like for example, Ratisha did um, research on neuroscience and I did research on agriculture. And the reason I did research on agriculture was it was because food insecurity is something that's really big to me. I love eating food and I want everyone to be able to do the same thing. And so I do research on like poverty and insecurity. And then I realized that that was something I want to do for the rest of my future. And I, my major was tailored in college to what I wanted. Um, yeah, so I see that question, follow-up question, that's how much cap does cap cost? And so if you register saying you came to this workshop, we'll give you $10 off and it'll be 69 total. And Ratisha actually has the display shown right now. And we can send the link once again in the chat so you can get access the flyer. Yep, and so we'll send that in the it's chat once again here. I'll do that right now. No worries, Ratisha. And it's and on it, July 25th and 26th from um, not 12 to 2 p.m. Eastern time, actually. It's from 3 to 30 to 5 p.m. Eastern time. For Pacific time, it would be 12. Yeah. Time. <laughs> Just changing the fly around for time zones. And then if there are any questions one-on-one, -on -one, feel free. We have another link right down below where you can sign up to have um, schedule with these questions and we're happy to help. Yeah, so we have the link in the chat with the college admissions prep series and you can sign up there and it'll be a two-day course 
where we deep dive into all of these questions and the Calendly link is a link for a separate scheduling. Cool. Yeah. And I just want to say one last thing before we wrap up. I noticed that in some of these qu questions, there was this common theme of being concerned of, will colleges actually be okay with me spending my time in high school pursuing a transdisciplinary field? Will colleges, um, or will I find a career if I pursue this kind of field? And I'll say that there's a lot of living proof that colleges want these kind of students. Me and my sister are living proof for it. We've helped students who are living proof for the fact that if you spend your time doing research into ancient medicine, which is what I did, or if you spend your time doing research into yoga, practicing Bharatanatyam, it's all about how you explain it to the colleges. It's not necessarily what you do, but it's about how you're explaining it to the colleges. And also Dr. Sean is living proof that you can pursue transdisciplinary fields and have a career as well. So there's so many um, people out there who you can look to as mentors for this and we'll help you um, craft your applications and do some writing um, workshops in this series as well. And the people that we've helped that got into Harvard, Yale, UPenn the, this year, Vanderbilt, and all the schools that we listed earlier all had transdisciplinary portions of their application. Mm -hmm. And so that's something that is very, very important because even if you don't think it's mainstream, that's okay because that makes you unique right now. And so that's something that's very important. Yep. So thank you for just, attending our session. Yes, thank you everyone for coming. Well, th thank you. This was a wonderful session. So I wanted to add on, you know, something. See, uh, even, see, for example, we have, uh, you know, many people who came from India. We have a poor English um, communication skills. So this is something that's very natural. Okay, so, uh, but a, at a level of, you know, international uh, level of expressing things or explaining things, you need a different language skill. And that language skill is available in all the kids who have attained here. So, because, you know, if you take like ancient medicine, uh, Siddha, Ayurveda, there are very few skills. There are few people only, have, they have the modern language skills. So, in order to write a paper even, uh, draft something, you need to have access to uh, this knowledge from India. So they don't know how to uh, publish a paper. It's very difficult even uh, you ask them to write an abstract. It's going to be difficult. But these kids can help them. And both together, you will learn the other science and they will learn a little bit of English. Uh, that's going to be very helpful. You can publish a paper together and you're going to be a co-author. And I have done that kind of thing even with with kids here and they are in very good schools already. So I have helped a number of students uh, from, you know, for the past uh, more than 15 years, I've been helping so many students into PhD field, how to build a resume, all these things. So now, um, Ritisha uh, as, and her sister, uh, uh, both are, uh, both are like uh, Thivya, um, they, ha they have taken our, all of our, you know, youth career accelerator program. It's it's it trained them, and they are from young age. They are they are into this. Uh, so it's very useful for all of you. Uh, if you don't know, I mean, if you're not, if you don't have a kid, you somebody might be out there. So some kid needs this help. <laughs> Excuse me. So spread this word. Uh, this is very very important because if you are losing your DNA thing, what is inside, you're, you're separated, you will not be happy with what you're doing. At the end, you will be doing some software, for some company and getting a job. What you are learning, what you're doing has no connections, but this will be with your heart, whatever you know, whatever you're loving, and that can be done. So only thing we have to plan a way ahead. So this is the right time. So even young age, when you're starting in middle school, you start this, the career starts then you can become whatever you could and shine in the in the field that you're interested in. And then you, it becomes a mainstream thing. And mainstream is now accommodating everything. Those days, yoga was not, uh, you know, uh, part of this. Today, yoga is, they're going to a deeper uh, level. And this is going to be like, uh, you know, in all the fields. Yoga is accepted. Ayurveda in California and all is completely accepted. Now, California state is moving towards tomorrow. It'll be, it might be approved uh, soon. So when California does, New York will be done. But the, by the time, many of the Indian parents and all, they will be learning, you know, they may not know these things. 
and they will be learning and from a going to a university and learning this they have already have this knowledge same thing is going to happen to music carnatic music is another amazing field bharatanatyam so this is so many uh, things are there yeah, so you you can you can really uh, be benefited when you are training your kids at this age they are going to be so different uh, so so i welcome all of you so uh, any other thing you wanted to add uh, ritisha devya so so that i can i can just make some announcements um well just thank you to everyone who came and if you have any questions please feel free to email us we're happy to help um answer any of your questions and we hope to see you guys at the cap series so thank you guys for coming and listening to us today aka if you have anything you'd like to add i uh, know i just wanted to say the same and our email if you have any more questions was listed above but we'll just send it one more time but thank you all so much and thank you dr shan for um the opportunity to present today thank you my my pleasure you you all did a wonderful job i think you know this is going to be exciting already we have some students interested and more students uh, if they can join you know that'll be wonderful and we are going to make the the first uh, uh, level of transformation i yeah. you know so uh, definitely you know okay so um so i have little bit uh, of announcement other than this you know we have what is called uh, we have a, so this is one of the see we have mous with uh, different colleges um all over uh, all over india so this is with the department of uh, physics uh, we are going to with sri narayana guru college so we are expected uh, people for this is around 800 um so if you wanted to join this is this is all free we are going to conduct a lot of free programs and some paid programs in india also this is also another opportunity many of the kids who are trained here can also train uh kids uh, people from india who wanted to pursue higher education or maybe confidence level or uh, you know in different other fields like um, uh, leadership programs or you know public speaking In, this is another area to train so we do a lot of things in the early morning at 5:30 eastern time uh you know 5 o'clock 5:30 that time you know i i spend a lot of time with in india india programs so there are a number of people who attend number of colleges all universities so we did already um, um the bardi dasan university the uh, anamali university uh, and uh, you know different uh, uh, now we are going to do tanjay uh tanjavur university and uh, many other university we also do tamil programs many of the tamil programs you know today this is with uh, in tamil and this is uh, regularly on siddha so this is going every week siddha veda mayam this is uh, with another uh, another college and um, you can look at this and this is called jamal mohammad jamal mohammad is a famous college uh, so we are conducting a joint program with them so we have you know uh, we are reaching in different fields uh, in different uh, areas so you all are welcome to join um, uh, any of this uh, so we are trying to expand as much as possible so people get uh, benefited uh, so you are welcome and you are also welcome to join our diploma uh, courses which is the ancient integrated medical science you know it's a, we have running a diploma course jointly offered by um yoga samaskrutam university and uh, siddha veda so that's already going on but you can join any time because the time period is like uh, we can always uh, be, because it's online we can we can always manage the time uh, you know shrink the time okay so another uh, course is the siddha uh, we also include the siddha anti anti medicine course so Uh, anti medicine course is just started see the anti medicine course started last week you are welcome to attend you can take just independent models and see how this course is we are going to discuss amazing uh, things in um <clears throat> uh you know for the thing yeah, kids uh, kids yoga is uh, going on so anti aging anti aging is uh, something that you need to 
attend. This is very, very useful. So we will have uh, 10 weeks class. We just started, uh, one week is gone and you still have the 10 weeks you can attend. We can give some discount. Um, already it's a discounted. Uh, so you please attend that and get the benefit of Siddha knowledge because this knowledge is going to be very useful. Your kids are going to attend this. They're going to learn. And they can see how yesterday, you know, last year we, we were talking about different herbs. Then agriculture field or herbology, both are applicable. You can choose that kind of a field. There are so many herbs that are available here. If you take care do a research, that's automatically you're doing contributing to our ancient science. Because many of the weeds that are here, they're uh, like clovers and, you know, the, um, what do you call the, um, the uh, what you call uh, normally we it's, it's it's available in the garden it's uh, you know I, I forgot that the name of this um, weed so you you can use a number of weed uh, the english name uh, i don't i forgot so you can use this kind of weed to do research and that's available here even in uh, in a herb herbarium in in um, Harvard, there are, it is like vast. All the things are available. So there is a, a word in a botanical word for each of this herb that is already available. So you can do the research here and you can publish those, those papers very easily. What that's your interest. You're already in Siddha, at Siddha knowledge you can do. So for that, if you're attending the anti-aging course, you, you can really learn a lot of small details. That'll be very important. So each of the course that we are doing very minutely, we have we have picked. The another is Ayurvedic dentistry. This is a course that is that's also um, very very important. We are we are covering a lot on the um, you know. So I have a, I think I have a, I can share that. Ayurvedic dentistry. So this is the course it's talking about. Um, okay, so Okay, so let me do it this way. So here is the course. You can look at uh, yeah. So there is another course called public speaking, which uh, you can attend. So these are, uh, give me a second, please. Okay, so the Ayurvedic dentistry will consist of a lot of uh, 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 things in, because that's a very unique course. Uh, looks like this one. Okay, so this is the anti-aging course I'm talking about. So what all we cover is here. Uh, so we already, I think the two classes, you know, we covered this week. So, but first was an introduction. So we can, we can catch up with that. So 10 classes. So this is the, see the anti-aging course is talking about. You can, you can involve your kids along with, and you can also learn. So that way it's very, very easy uh, to guide your kid. So I usually take even little thing for my small kids. I take the courses, whatever they're taking, like Carnatic music or swimming or even ice skating, because that's how we can, we can really teach them together, you know? So that's one thing you wanted to do, even if they're senior and we can always upgrade ourselves in that knowledge. So another, yeah, so this is the summer camp is still going. So Kishore was asking, the summer camp the summer camp we had successfully it's going on so we're going to extend summer camp 
so maybe we going to shorten that and we are going to come with innovative programs so we have understood what is needed in the first summer group and it was all the uh, classes were very successful and uh, feedback was really good the kid we are going to get more feedback from them this week also so far it was good kids really loved enjoyed it i wish every kid could be here it was very very uh, innovative we wanted to bring innovative programs and uh, so this was you know it's a life changing you you look at the videos of the kids how they have transformed so we'll we'll share it with all of you okay and um, so make use of this this program so i'm going to share the another one right uh, it's not on top of uh, my head uh, the anti aging <laughs> will said can you share anti aging okay uh, not the anti aging the um, dentistry wilson you want to share you have the okay so this is the course i'm not seeing the flyer here right away because the whatsapp of limitations to show everything on like the, the phone version is different so this is the course this is also uh somebody chatting okay okay all right so uh yeah well let me you know let me just uh, go another way um so we we'll just do the dentistry here yeah this is the course i want so uh, this is a very important course we just did an introduction only there is and you know if you can learn this is where you can actually if your kid is involved and if she is involved in you wanted to do a modern research this is a people the people they are doing mainstream education applied ayurvedic dentistry in that and they are practicing we have been very successful so oh, dr vaibhavi and dr sugumar are teaching they are you know shalit and they are, they are like dr sugumar is a ayurvedic um, surgeon he can do surgery in ayurveda so so they are amazing uh, people and um, so much of experience but people we don't know we think that you know ayurveda dentistry means they are giving some uh, tooth powder or something oil oil pulling that no It's a vast knowledge. There is so much of knowledge, um, you know, about the teeth. What we know in modern science is very, very tiny. So this is going to be very useful, and make use of this opportunity. Your kids can learn this. I am like, what can I do? So much of knowledge is there. Why people are not taking? It's very difficult to market because marketing is like, whom do I market? modern people will take this definitely but it has to be um that's that's in a different way you have to present it but this need to go to first this tradition from where it it came from so that's why we are trying to get into this tradition but very unfortunate people are not making use of this opportunity uh so i would definitely uh you know suggest because he, as kishor was saying um in this pandemic nobody want to go to dent dentist so if you know how to do this they are saying you know you don't have to go to the dentist you can do everything at home very rare cases you have to go to the dentist that's the thing so that will prevent us from you know major things happening um in terms of you know removing your canines you removing your uh, wisdom tooth all these things so you can prevent that so 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 much of knowledge is there and please you know please please try to learn attend you can attend and see if you do if you attend freely that's okay 
you can attend one or two sessions see how it works and then you can you can uh, take this session right so the, if you wanted to build a career they wanted to build a career and i am helping them so because all these people they are experts in that if they want to build a career it need to be paid and how that is going to happen people who don't know will have to take that and that's how it is and that's why where you can think about a career for yourself or your kids tomorrow because somebody need to pay for it right so that's how the 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 world is and we have to move towards this kind of uh, thing it's not about like oh your yoga you know yoga need to be free that's you know that's a different thing you know that days are gone so it's not about that we are trying to build a career it's not about like yoga is free wisdom is free of course wisdom yoga is free that's like at a time uh, when you really wanted to give it free that's that's okay but in general this is going to be uh, very useful for your uh, for the life okay so i wanted to uh, stop here if you have any questions in general you can you can unmute i can uh, allow you to unmute yourself okay Yeah, we already passed time. So, okay. Anything you wanted to, uh, you can approach uh, for uh, the other programs in general. We can approach. Uh, see the are these courses are there? Any courses will be opening up soon later. Uh, to neuroscience, yes. Well, you have to take Varmakalai. Varmakalai is neuroscience. I call femto neurobiomagnetic therapy. And psycho neuroimmunology. That's the word. So this is how you need to use. If I have to translate, it's a problem because when I translate, our this tradition people won't know. So that's the problem. So we have to. When I say varmakalai or something, you know, that's also difficult. Today, you know, people varmakalai means they think it's like something not connected to modern science. Varmakalai is femto neurobiomagnetic therapy. It's a neuroscience. It's completely neuroscience. So, um, so you you have to know the word. If you know the word, how to use this word, everything is scientific, and you can connect with the modern. Even in some things, you cannot connect with modern because modern has limitations. That paradigm shifting is need to happen. That study is okay, but there is an area where you can integrate. That is the area we are talking about. Right? Like how. Ritisha and uh, Devi were doing that area. That's a connection area where you can do something. That's for your living, but that's not far away from that. Will be a part of a mainstream also. But you know, that's a little karma free. But paradigm shift is um, completely karma free. Okay. So femto neuro biomagnetic therapy. Yes, femto neuro is very tiny neurons. Uh, so we call it femto neuron because it's the tiniest neurons. Our body. Uh, well, the Varmakale course we starts uh, depending on. I take very few students, ten students per class. I train them into a very modern knowledge. Uh, all uh, about explain about how pain mechanism, what is how pain is happening in our body, how all the energy particles in our body transform. Uh, you know, do different things in our body. You know, especially you know some kind of a pain as different kind of pain. You have like a gas kind of pain here, and you may think that's an heart attack. So I will tell you how the mechanism happens. So when you know that, you're not scared anymore. You know how your body functions. So that kind of a knowledge when you're using, you can use that knowledge, and you can if you can do research and because acupuncture is very well known field, and acupuncture came from ancient our traditional Suchibarna. Or uh, you know, Siddha Varmakale, Ma Marma Mudre, Marma Uchi Travukol. So that's uh, it came from there. So today, in uh, using lasers, um, our word is is training that. So that means people already have anatomy. So that is available. So that means you can uh, do Varmakale in modern sense. So that's that's clear. So if you know learn Varmakale, you can practice, you can become an expert in that. So this is what you wanted to do. We want you all to train in this. All the, we want to uh, train the kids so that they know all these things and apply. 
so throughout the things so we need different people to uh, teach at different levels so that's why we are coming at a, we are not we were initially not uh, capable to teach the kids now we are, we are trying to build a capability to understand you know how the kids think and it's going good we can improvise on that yeah um yes yeah of course rupesh yes definitely you can sign you can sign up you can talk to us talk to me directly you can sign up for these courses but i definitely uh, suggest you know uh, I, i would less maybe i can give a basic course to everyone uh, on you know varmakale how to learn varmakale is different you don't have to learn the way therapeutic you're talking about first this point that's point that's not going to be very helpful if you learn from the fundamentals of how things move in our body scientifically then that's that the science itself understanding the science itself will make the movement and therapy much easier right so because the thought is connected with the with the way how we function and all the logics are set up in the thought so the each movement what is happening inside has to do with how our thought flows and therefore it's going to function much uh, uh, better than you know ordinarily learning marmakale you know so uh, that's the difference yeah okay so any hope you all enjoyed this co uh, today session so next week we will have uh, um an expert in uh, we are bringing two experts one in siddha and another one is in family uh yeah, and kids yeah, how to raise raise kids yeah, raise yeah, kids yeah. okay so that's uh, you can uh, okay how to raise kids why what is important in raising a kid so those that kind of a topic we an expert so next week you can don't miss this uh, opportunity okay so we'll we we'll cover that all right okay thank you all thank you all see you all next week